There is a problem in physics that only has one singular solution. Well, actually, there's a few problems like this, but in this video, we'll be looking at one such problem in the field of electrostatics. That is the study of electric charges that are stationary or not moving, hence electrostatics. We'll see that this problem in question only has one possible solution. And as well as this, we'll see why that information is useful to physicists in the first place. So if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Now, this one solution problem that we'll be looking at is to do with the Poisson and Laplace equations, both of which I've discussed in a video previously on this channel. If you want a more detailed description of these equations after watching this video, check it out up here. So here's a quick overview of what we're interested in. Firstly, we'll be talking about the electric field. This is what is generated by electrically charged objects, and it basically tells us how other electrically charged objects will behave when placed in a region of space where an electric field is present. For example, if we have an electric field generated by this object, in this case, a charged particle, and we place another small positively charged particle in this field, then that small positive charge will experience a force and the electric field tells us about that force. For example, it tells us what direction the force will be in, and of course the size of each arrow tells us something about the size of the force experienced by the small charged particle. Of course, if we were to place a small negatively charged particle in the same place in our electric field, it would experience a force in the opposite direction. In other words, positive and negative charges behave opposite to each other, and we can see that this makes a little bit of sense. If we have two positive charges, a small one and the big one generating our field, these are repelled from each other because they're like charges. But if we have opposite charges, a positive and a negative, then they attract each other. So that's a brief overview of the electric field. It is a vector field because we can assign a vector or an arrow representing something to every single point in this region of space. In this case, the thing that it represents is related to the force experienced by other charged objects in this region of space. The second quantity that we're interested in looking at is known as the electric potential. This is exactly the same as the potential that we talk about or the voltage that we talk about when dealing with electric circuits. Essentially, we can assign a number to every point in this region of space. And if we were to place a small charged object in this field, it would move in the direction in which the value of the potential field changes most quickly. So for example, if we place a small positive charge here, it would move in the direction where the potential value decreased the quickest. Now, a potential field is a scalar field because we can assign a scalar or a number to every point in this region of space, but it's very closely linked to the electric field that we talked about a few moments ago. Remember that charged objects move in the direction that the potential field changes the quickest. And actually, if we find the gradient of the potential field, that basically ends up being the electric field. Now, when I say finding the gradient of the potential field, what I mean is applying a gradient operator, which looks like this, an upside down triangle. This upside down triangle is known as a nabla or a del, and I've made a few different videos talking about it. But if you want to learn about it from scratch, then please check out this video up here. Essentially, when we apply this nabla operator to our potential field, what we're doing is we're finding the gradient of this field. We're finding the direction in which the potential field changes the quickest. And as well as the direction, we find how quickly it changes. In other words, the quicker this field changes, the larger the vector we can assign to it. And that vector is the electric field. Well, technically, the electric field is defined as minus the gradient of the potential field, but that's not really important here. So we've laid some groundwork, but what is the relevance of all of this to our one solution problem? Well, let's imagine that we're studying the behavior of electric fields in a particular region of space. Let's say within this region here. Let's imagine that this surface that I've drawn here is actually a 3D surface, like a sphere. But it's just easier to show as a 2D circle. Now, if we look at the behavior of our electric field, we're obviously also studying the behavior of our potential field because they're very closely linked to each other. And how the potential field should behave in any region of space within our universe is governed by Poisson's equation, which looks something like this. Again, we see the Nabla operator, but this time we see it as being squared. This is kind of like finding the gradient of the gradient of the potential field. And this equation just tells us that the gradient of the gradient of the potential field has to behave in a very specific way. It has to equal this quantity on the right hand side. Now rho is actually equal to the density of electric charges inside our region of space. What I mean by that is how much electric charge there is per unit volume inside our region of space. 
And for now, epsilon naught is just a constant. We don't need to worry too much about it. It's just a number for our purposes. So what we're seeing here is that something about the potential field, specifically del squared applied to the potential field, has to behave in such a way that it depends on the charge density inside the region of space that we're considering. This is how potential and electric fields have to behave in order to follow the laws of physics, or at least classical physics and Maxwell's equations. Now, let's also imagine that we somehow know exactly what the potential is at every single point on the surface, on the boundary that we've drawn here. One way this could happen is if we had, for example, a conducting metal sphere that was hollow, where we were able to measure the value of the potential at each point on the sphere, but we couldn't necessarily access inside the sphere. So we want to try and work out what happens inside the sphere in terms of the values of the potential or the electric field. To make things simple for now, let's also say that there are no charges inside the sphere. We could do this problem with charges inside the sphere, but it's easier to explain without any charges in there. The reason for that is because if there are no charges in our region of space, then the charge density becomes zero, and therefore the right-hand side of our equation becomes zero. If the right-hand side of an equation that looks like this is zero, it's no longer known as Poisson's equation, it's now known as Laplace's equation. In other words, Laplace's equation is a special case of Poisson's equation. Now here's the thing. Let's assume for now that there are two different solutions to this equation. What we mean by this is that there are two different possible versions of V, of the potential field, that have exactly the same values as what we've measured on the surface, but look slightly different to each other within the sphere. We'll label these two different solutions as V1 and V2, and obviously we're representing them in different colors here as well. And of course, both of these potential fields must be solutions to Poisson's equation, because that's what we're trying to solve. That's what we're saying is governing real life in this particular case. At this point, it becomes very useful to consider another quantity entirely, one that will generate by subtracting one potential field from another. Let's call this new quantity V, and we're saying that this is equal to V2 minus V1. What that means is that we take the value at every single point in space of V2, and we subtract the value of V1 at those same points in space. And notice that on our boundary, on our surface, the value of V is zero everywhere, because both V1 and V2 had exactly the same values on the surface. They were based on our experimental measurements, as we said earlier. This is important, and we'll need to keep that in mind for later. Additionally, because of the way Laplace's equation works, we can also see that V is a solution to Laplace's equation. In other words, nabla squared applied to V is also equal to zero. This equation also holds true for V, not just for V1 and V2. If you know vector calculus, feel free to pause the video to see what I mean by this. At this point, we can use some general mathematical identities as well as some more vector calculus, stuff that doesn't just apply to electric fields, but applies to all kinds of vectors and scalars in general. We can find out that V must be a constant. Again, feel free to pause the video and look through what I've done here. But the point is that V must be constant, the same at every single point in the region of space we happen to be considering. But remember we saw earlier that V was zero on the boundary. It had to be because V2 and V1 were the same as each other on the boundary. They just differed at what happened away from the boundary. Or at least that's what we were assuming. Because what we find out now is that if V must be a constant based on our mathematics and V is zero on the boundary, then that means that V must be zero everywhere, or at least everywhere in the region of space we happen to be considering, of course. That sounds like a pretty useful result, and here's why. Remember that V was found by subtracting V1 from V2. And then if V is zero everywhere, then that must mean that V2 is equal to V1. In other words, we started by assuming that there were two different solutions to our problem. And we've just proven that those two solutions must be the same as each other. They cannot be different to each other. In other words, there is one and only one solution to this problem such that it follows Poisson's equation, or Laplace's equation in this case, and it follows the boundary conditions that we set at the beginning based on what we measured. This proof is known as the uniqueness theorem for Laplace's equation. It tells us that there is only one unique solution to our problem. So why do we care if there's only one unique solution? Doesn't this make life harder for us if we know that there's only one solution rather than 10 or 20 or however many? Well, actually it does the opposite. It actually makes life easier because if we know that there is only one possible solution, then it doesn't matter what we do to find that solution. If we can find it, we know it must be the only one. And therefore, 
everything that we're studying in real life must behave in the way as suggested by our found solution. In other words, we don't need to go through the very difficult process of solving this equation in order to try and work out what our potential field should look like. All we need to do in some cases is make a guess. Because sometimes there are physical systems where making a guess is very much possible. We use the symmetry of the system and everything else we know about electric fields to guess what the solution should be. And then we just plug it into our equation to check that it works. This is much easier than going the other way and actually solving the problem to try and find out what our solution should be. All we've done is guess and plug it in and checked it. And if it works, we know it's the only solution. I find that really interesting, and it's worth me noting at this point that I've only discussed one aspect of the uniqueness theorem where we say we know the potential values at our boundary. There is also another case where we know the electric field values at the boundary, and also another one where we have mixed boundary conditions. All that kind of stuff is a bit more complicated, and we're not going to talk about it here, but there are some useful links in the description below if you're interested in finding out more. And of course, I've left out some mathematical details and intricacies, but I wanted to introduce you to this idea that there are certain systems where there's only one possible solution. This means that whatever we do to find the solution, whether we solve the problem or guess or we use any other method that we know of, if we find a solution, that's the only one. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. I have some merch out now. It's a quantum dice design based on a famous quote by Albert Einstein. If you'd like to check it out, then there's a link to that in the description below. I also want to say a huge thank you to my Giga patrons as well as all of my other patrons. Link to my Patreon in the description below as well if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.